Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Stephanie Stevens Show. This is Friday, June 12th. Thank you guys so much for joining me here on my show. Today, we are talking about the trans community and things that concern the trans community when they need help. So we actually asked a couple of the young ladies that work within many different communities to help um, bring awareness to certain issues that the trans community face every day. So today on my show, I like to say, please welcome Miss Katanya Richards to my show. She is a worker at Black Cap. And hi, lady, how are you? Hi, Stephanie, I am okay. What about yourself? I'm doing very well. Um, it's hot as hell in Toronto today. <laughs> yeah, it is. And it's getting bleaky. I don't understand the weather. One minute it is so hot, then the next mm -hmm. minute it is cold. It's I know. <laughs> so, so now that you've been locked down in quarantine, what have you been doing? Well, I am actually one of the lucky ones that actually work from home still because I work for the Black Cap organization, which is funded by the city and different government organizations. Role is the African Caribbean adoption fair. So my job is to work mostly with the Black trans girls who have mental issues dealing with the pandemic, cold droppings, see where they're going with their life, what they need assistance with, the housing, finding them the right doctor to get them on the right medication. Also going into the community and distributing harm reduction supplies to reduce the overdoses that we are seeing because since, of, since the lockdown, there has been a very vast amount of actually overdose usage and deaths. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was watching the news yesterday and I saw that last month alone in Toronto, we had 127 overdoses in downtown Toronto. Yeah. Now, as we know, a lot of that is just a lot of people at risk, meaning from different um, portions of society. And um, But for us, it seems to touch the gay community and the trans community the most. And why do you think this is? I think because we are still at the bottom of the food chain. I believe people don't get to know us, and I find that they're actually... A lot of us that are trans or transitioning, whether you're a trans man or a trans female, you are subject to loneliness and rejection from family and rejection from everyone around you because they don't quote unquote appreciate your lifestyle. Well, we have a very few families that do accommodate that lifestyle, but the majority don't. They put them out, they have to go to shelters, they beat them up. So having a, an ally or forming an alliance with these people they are very intelligent after speaking to them and they have a lot of goals. They're willing to work, they're willing to do this, but it's not, they don't have that stepping stone. So that is where I come in to help them educate to find out exactly what do you need right now? What position are you in? Where are you looking to go? And if there are drug users, for example, I would make sure that I give them enough supplies for them to last, make sure they're staying, they're not reusing the needles, the bowls, the cakes, the pipes, to make sure that they're not overdosing on anything. But okay. it all boils down back to the family and them not having a family. So it's a really lonely road to me. Okay. Now, what does Black Cap actually mean? What, what, what's, what's, the, what's the organization's message? It's, it actually is Black Cap stands for Black Coalition Against AIDS Prevention. So within the entity, the organization of itself, there are different, there are different um, departments and people are dealing with different aspects. So there's mental health. There's a director of, um, of mental health promotions, which is my boss, Chris. Then you get someone that's dealing with the youth. Then you have someone that's dealing with the women. Then you have someone that's dealing with the trans man. And then you have me, of course, that deals with the trans women. And we have resettlement services. We offer support 
for our black community because actually our black community is overlooked when it comes mm -hmm. to that. Okay, now that you've said that, how is it, how do you reach out to people that are suffering, like you said, from mental illness, drug addiction, or um, just the mere fact of being marginalized within communities upon other communities? Because we're not just within the gay community, we live in other communities as well. How do you reach out to these young trans women and marginalized women to offer them the programs at Black Camp. Where do you find them? Actually, what happened when I first took over in order to find these girls to come to join Black Camp and come into the program, I spent a lot of time out in the community where they would frequent maybe the bars, maybe the streets. I also actually advertised a lot. I went into living shelter and I actually um, in collaboration with Koski Shelter and Spadina, I have done workshops with them on how to deal with trans people because they're offering a shelter and they didn't know how to deal with trans, trans people. So I actually did a workshop with them. I mm -hmm. actually did two workshops, one on how to deal with trans people and the second was in harm reduction. So, right, and also, you also take the network, the network, sorry, and the partnership. So if they have someone that is going through maybe anxiety, depression, mental health, they would always refer to us. So they would refer them to us and we would take the necessary steps to help them and give them the support that we know we can give them. You know, this is wonderful. Like I, you know, I said, I'd say this in quite a few of my different conversations. It's wonderful that we actually have these programs and these platforms now to where we can actually talk to each other, see each other and share great information, stuff that was kind of hard for us back in the day. Now, are you seeing any real success from your work? 100%. When I first started the group, we had a drop-in at the organization at Black Cap on Victoria Street, and I started the group with approximately three girls. Now, I have approximately up to 25 girls, so I am actually in discussion with my boss because my caseload has gone from here to there, right? So okay. it's actually abroad, so we have seen an influx in numbers, especially when we're doing our monthly drop-in. Um, we are seeing that numbers because the girls now have something they can come on to or they can talk to via virtual and face-to-face. -face. And I would always schedule one-on-one -on -one sessions with them, stress relievers, how you're doing. Tell me how and describe your day in a color right now. If they say red, why are you feeling red? Or describe yourself as a dish. Uh, I may feel like soup. Or it may feel like a salad. Why are you doing that? And we still do group activities. So now with this pandemic, honestly, I know it's bad. The pandemic is bad. But it actually brought up more girls to seek more assistance and to get the help that they need. And plus, the girls in the group that are already in the group, they actually refer other girls and tell them about the group. And the group is called TICS, by the way. It stands mm -hmm. for Trans Information Toronto Sisters. So okay. they would refer the girls and tell them, hey, we are part of this program. We have drop-ins, we have activities. And the girls will actually get in contact with me. And the other girls, they would refer them over to me as well. Mm -hmm. You know, that is wonderful. I like the way you said that. It just was amazing because it showed that, like you said, the pandemic was bad in one way, but it worked in a positive way for a lot of marginalized people that wouldn't have been got, getting these services if it wasn't for this pandemic. Great, great, great great work you do i mean i'm just listening to you just for just a few minutes it's great great work that black cap does and you know i've been in this community 31 years i was with them in the trenches when we didn't have nothing and no services i know and it was just everybody was just dying and it was just we didn't have anything to look forward to but it's great now that we have these positive programs and these positive organizations that are reaching out to people on a constant basis. And you know, living in Toronto, we're blessed to have healthcare, 
And we're blessed to have a lot of these amazing programs for us. Now, your life in Canada, where you, where, how, did, I understand how you identify, but just can you tell our audience, so this way they hearing it from you. I identify as a female because of the, the transitioning process. So everything is female. There's nothing, I should say, male about me um, okay. from my transition right into female. So being from Barbados, okay. I used to live in Barbados there. And it can be hard living your life as a gay person or LGBTQ person within mm -hmm. Barbados because of society. Some people are accepting and some people are not. So actually to go to work like this, I would never get a job mm -hmm. in Barbados because I look like this. And such Barbados is such a small country, a very, very small country. Everyone knows something or always know about someone. So I just had enough of it because there's no way that I'm going to be in a country where I can contribute to your workforce and you're hiring me because you're not hiring me or refusing me because of my appearance. Mm -hmm. So I just decided, okay, it's time to go migrate to Canada. Mm -hmm. Now, your road, let's just say you have found success in Canada. I hear you're married now. Oh, look at that. Oh, my God. So how did you and your, 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 your husband before you decided that you were both in love. Did you ever have the discussion about that you were male before? Of course, I actually, when I met him, I told him because he would pick me up because he, we would chat online. Well, I first met him online on tag. So mm -hmm. I was there and I met him and he, it took me three days. Then I'm sure if he sees this, he's going to tell everyone it's true. It took him three days, took me, sorry, three days for me to respond to him. And I told him, he said, can I have your number? I said, well, there's something that you need to know about me. I'm not your type. But then he put up this defensive wall and said, how do you know I'm not your type? I said, well, I'm a transsexual. So after five minutes, I said, he came back. I said, did you put the word? And we both laughed about it. He said, you're sexy. So then we began, we exchanged numbers and we began to, create a bond and I showed him pictures of me before as a male, pictures of me now, and he's quite up as well. He's my husband, so he okay. I showed him so, everything. I don't hide. And I believe that when a trans woman meets someone, they should always tell them 100 percent tell them your story. Let that individual man make the decision to go with you or not to go with you. Because okay. if you don't tell him and he goes with you because you know some of them, some of us girls are pre op and post op. Mm -hmm. That means some of us has the female genitalia and some of us still have our male genitalia. Okay. So if you're one of those and the guys say, well, okay, they're looking to see this, they're not going to see between your legs because your clothes are on. So I tell him not telling him and then getting in the bed with him and doing that, that can lead to something very destructive. Mm -hmm. Now, now that you've said that, I, I want to just point out one thing. When you when you think about government ID in Canada, I know in the U.S. they're making a move towards changing the gender on identification. Now, have we reached that point in Canada yet? Yes, we have. All of my IDs are female. I don't have nothing male about me. Um, what happens is, is that you go to see an endocrinologist or your doctor, and your doctor mm -hmm. will always write a letter for you, and your mm -hmm. doctor will say, well, the gender does not match the identity. And then you take it into Service Canada, you have your name change, but you must spend one year in Ontario before you actually change your name and change your gender at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, now that you've said that, now, how important is your work at Black Cap. How important, just so people can understand that Black Cap means business when they are reaching out to help you. 
They never had a role, like this as Black Cap, as you identified before, and mm -hmm. it came into the role. Actually, no one knew where the role was going to or the vast extent because this is the first time. Mm -hmm. So me being running a call center for years, so one of my trans friends said, Kitani, you need, to, you need to get out of the call center and try something new. And I was like, okay. And they said Black Cap is hiring. However, it is very important for my role because we have so many black girls out there that are suffering from anxiety, suffering from the lack of support, suffering from the lack from mental stability. And it's very important as humans, not only for LGBTQ, that we have that support, especially when we're going through that. Mm -hmm. Right? So the work is going into the field, getting hands-on with the community, working with partnership networks, working with Shoreboard, working with different um, partners to ensure not only that we are coming together to seek the best interest, but we provide what we say we are going to do. Okay. So it's actually, it's something that is extremely important. And these girls never had never had this before and they're very very grateful for it because they have someone that they can look up to look upon go to with their problems because i also help them with their mental issues i talk to them one-on-one -on -one. i listen to them sometimes i tell them don't you don't if you have a problem don't even care what time it is you can call me on my work phone that is not a problem we're going to talk about it because the last thing that i want these girls to do is to think there's no one out there that doesn't care about them or their interests. Now, now that you said that as well, how how do we change? You know, our community sometimes can be its own worst enemy. And you know, sometimes even though the trans have the they're they're active in the um, trans march and um, trying to bring trans awareness to respect. Um, trying to just show people that they matter as well in the world. But yet, when it, sometimes when it comes to the performers who might not totally identify as trans or their drag queens or female impersonators or however they feel that they identify as, sometimes our own community chastise up because I've heard this word so many times and it's brought the fight on every time tranny. Why? What? How I can we change that? I despise that tranny because I, you see, that's a culture. It's a habit that they adopt. So it's mm -hmm. like the new fashion trends are coming down, like the Samsung S20 Ultra Plus. Everyone is going to want one of those. So they're so accustomed to calling it the ultra is that when they go back, is they're so accustomed to looking at every person as a transsexual, they call them tranny for short. Mm -hmm. And it will take a lot of work for them to actually change that word to reflect female or just transsexual. And it also have to do with the individual because if I'm you're talking to me and you're going to refer me as a tranny, I said, okay, well, I don't feel too comfortable for you calling me a tranny. So can mm -hmm. you please refrain and stop from that? So it will take a lot of hard work and we have to have actually bring awareness to the person that's saying it to us mm -hmm. in our face. So we have to let them know where we stand. It's like okay. if they call us the wrong name, say for instance, somebody call me, Katarina. That's not my name. My name is Katanya. Mm -hmm. But you actually have to correct them. So it's still work in progress and we're currently working on that, but it will take some time to reach the place in which it needs to be. Okay. Now, uh, just this is a sensitive question concerning religion and us being, you know, coming from most of us that are Christians or however else we celebrate religion um, under whatever it is. But in the black community, it's mostly about Christianity. So how is it that we don't, we see the black churches reaching out to, like you said, the shelters and the, what they consider the normal society, but you never see them step in to take charge and help and focus 
on the LGBT two spirit pronoun community and mainly the trans community. It has been that way for many years, and I don't believe it because there's no way that you are Christian and you are choosing to help a certain group of people, heterosexuals, people that are not gay, are not trans, are not non-binary. You cannot choose. It's either you're going to accept us all or why are you there then? Because I am so tired of hearing people and I know I may get dinged for this, but this is my personal opinion. I am so tired that from the time that people hear about, okay, you're trans, or you are gay, they run for the Bible. Why? Are there any other educational resources that you can use to get your point across? But yet in the Bible, it says, no weapon form against me shall prosper, but you run for a Bible. And at the end of the day, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God because you're not going to come and tell me that God is going to put me in the pits of hell because of who I am and I am gay. But yet, you had children out of wedlock, you wear mixed match clothing, you eat pork, all these things the Bible speak about. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand where you're coming from. It really baffled me for years and years and years and years because mm -hmm. I had an experience in Barbados, whereas I was beginning to transition before I came and the Jehovah's Witness will come to my house. And from the time they see me, they will say, men should not lie with men. And, I, and I'm like, what do you mean? And they will say, your lifestyle is wrong. I said, my lifestyle is wrong, but no offense to you. You're also in sin because look at you. You have on a denim skirt and a polyester blouse. Are those not mismatched fabrics? And they would actually close the Bible and run away. They don't want to hear me anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I just wanted to say that because for, you know, my parents were heavy Christians, but they never chastised me for just being me. And me and my sister, we talk a lot about our folks because we miss them, but yet they were very good to us without ever throwing the Bible in our face. I'm the baby, my sister's in the middle, my brother's the older. But they never, even though we all came from, we all had three different lifestyles. My brother was sort of like you said, he was all over town with every kind of woman in the world and ended up marrying outside of his race, which at the time our parents thought, I don't want white people in my house, this and that, even though our neighbor was white. And then my sister ended up marrying her first husband, who she's married to today, that's white. And then there's me, the baby, the gay one, that all my relationships have been mostly European men. Now, what do you think, how do you think, do you really feel, do you think the LGBT community embraces the church? Do you think they go? Do you think they attend church? I don't think the vast majority of things in church, I could be wrong because they're so afraid of rejection. And with all that is going on, I mean, you're rejected by your family. You're rejected by society. And now you go to the church where you thought that you were being accepted and loved because of what Christianity is all about. And then they reject you and our priests may get up and say, we don't want that kind of person in our church and ask them to leave. So. Mm -hmm. If that's alone, it's very heartbreaking because you're turning away and then, you, and then you're preaching words and saying, Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, but you're still mm -hmm. turning away God's creation. Mm -hmm. You know, I have learned so much. I miss my parents so much, but they always taught me to just love. And this is why no matter, you know, we can always say, this happened to us and that happened to us. But you always have to just get up and keep getting up. And I learned that just, you have to love everyone. You don't have to get along with them. You can just stay clear of them, but you have to love them for just being human beings and just being what we are here for, is to love each other, take care of each other, and that's what life is about. But for somewhere along the line, we have chosen so many different, I'm this, I'm that, I'm over here, I'm over there, 
I don't like you, you're this, you're that. And it's putting so many barriers in the way of where we are to go. Now, a perfect example is I watched something that was trending a lot on Facebook and YouTube and all these places when the pandemic hit and the ch little children weren't going to school. Now, before, we've always talked about how you teach children to hate and discriminate, but nobody ever paid it any attention. But if you ever sit in a classroom and watch how kids really interact with each other normally, you don't see what we practice today when they're first growing up. 100% because actually the generations are changing. Mm -hmm. And what we, are, I mean, we were raised by parents who would put us, who mm -hmm. would eat us up. When we do something wrong, we would get lashes, we would get spanked. It's a whole different generation now where you can't spank a child, you have to take away, take, take away sorry, my baby just came out, <laughs> take okay. away their devices, you have to take away their phones and all that to for them to understand the importance of good behavior. But is that working? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Is that working for that person? It, it may work for me, yes, but it won't work for you because I'm saying, okay, well, I'll just be without my phone for a week and then she'll give me it back. And then I may go and do the same behavior again. And she'll just take away, my parents will just take away my laptop, my phone, my TV. But we have to find different ways because if we can't spank the child, we have to mm -hmm. find ways and very more effective and efficient ways to ensure that whatever punishment that you're delivering to that child, they understand that it cannot be done again. So it's like finding, like if you have a cold or you have a sinus, it's actually finding the right medication mm -hmm. so you can combat that and you can heal properly. So we need to, as parents, because the generation is actually okay. changed, we need to find other, other different ways to ensure that our children are, have been disciplined in manners mm -hmm. now, in the home and outside. Okay. And now I want to just go back to, I have a few more questions for you because sure. you've, been you've been really helpful and enlightening and I'm amazed yeah. and, I'm, I, and I'm just blessed that people like you that represent us are in our community to help us. So um, I'm, I'm grateful. Now, let's talk about the LGBT two-spirited community in downtown Toronto. As you know, in the last few years, our city has come under a lot of scrutiny because of Pride Toronto and Black Lives Matter. What do you think has happened? Where has the communication broken down that we are at a standstill with one of the most powerful celebrations that bought respect money to the city and gave us a real voice. I don't think that we should let it actually phase us. We should still continue doing what we're doing. Don't let anything, because with that move, that pride move, um, movement and the pride that we have for our whole month of June for the entirety of having pride. I mean, it's something where people can connect you will find people, you will talk to people, you will share common stories, and you will find that you meet other brothers and sisters are, that are actually going through a lot and you can help them. And I mean, I believe it's only for the money, but do they really care if we have pride or not? Do they? Mm -hmm. It's only to bring financial stability or to generate income because you know for pride people come out and they spend money, they do this and they do etc. So mm -hmm. I mean, does it really, really, really have an impact on government and society? Mm -hmm. Because with all of a sudden now, everybody wants to do a pride. The straight wants to do a pride without gay pride. I mean, we're, we're setting trends because they didn't want a pride until they see a gay pride, right? Mm -hmm. Now, so I believe that 
And for the Black Lives Matter, I refuse to partake in that because you cannot tell me that all lives matter when you turn around and beat up a Black trans girl. You're telling me that only certain lives matter. Mm -hmm. And I think that as soon as, it, as trans girls actually bond together our voices, this nonsense mm -hmm. will stop. Because you don't see our community going around, okay, you're straight, and beating you up. No. We don't okay. do that. So why are you going to do it to us? And then you're going to demonstrate, protest, take all your energy, and take all your time, and say Black Lives Matter, turn around and be a uh, trans girl, although she's Black. So what are you telling me then? How are you expecting people to take you serious? Okay. Now, just a couple of more questions. Now, since the pandemic, now, it brought a lot of attention and, and it, it actually brought out a lot of awareness of what is actually happening within our community. Now, I noticed now that a lot of the bars will not be opening back up and a lot of the performers, some of them trans, who relied on this income, what do you think they should do if they really, because a lot of them probably use the bars and the income as sort of a way of just trying to pay the bills, but yet using it to sort of slowly maybe transform, I mean, transition and um, sort of, you know, just try to live a normal life and contribute to their community with entertainment, but yet slowly, maybe they identify as trans. But now that resource of that income will be gone. 100%. I mean, if they're performers and they're being, and they're being um, legitimate, they should be paying taxes. There you go. Uh, on some part of it, but if they don't, we hear a black cat from how here in Canada, but we do help. We will give out gift cards for the grocery stores. We have the mm -hmm. Aya Project, and the Aya Project do grocery mm -hmm. deliveries where if you don't have food, you can reach out to myself or you can reach out to anyone at Black Cat and say, hey, well, I need a grocery delivery. And the groceries are actually from a Black um, grocery store. You get all your pork, your chicken, your pears, your um, sorrel, everything that you can think about and it's not only one box because one box can feed a family of five mm -hmm. so if you're a big family we will give you two boxes three boxes it all depends i know we can't help you with um your bills at the moment and mm -hmm. but that will take some stress off of you because you will have food you will have your gift cards and it so pains me that i saw the other day they're sending around for the first 50 persons for the first 50 girls that actually sign up for this link, they get $200. But I mean, our community is big and the trans community is big. Why are you gonna choose 50 girls? Mm -hmm. You should have expanded that number to a more wider number. And then this and the one for the first 100, at least if they connect with us, they will know where the next meal is coming from that they have right to. Mm -hmm. They have they have bills to pay. They may have a, a person that they need to take care of. So for me, what I would suggest them to do is if you can go on ODSP or OW to get some financial help until you get back on your foot. While you can still continue to do your shows online, people can watch and you advertise it. So that way you have a little bit of buffer that will help you through these hard economic times during the pandemic. You know, that was that that's great advice. So for you ladies out there, just remember um, um, Katanya Richards is here to help you from Black Cat if you need food. Um, and she can also direct you to social services, which can help you with some financial income. Black Cat cannot help you with income, but they will help direct you to how you can get some support doing this pandemic and during the rough times. Now, you know, Katanya, I just want to say thank you. 
and thank you for all the hard work that you do. You know, you know, I've, I've, like I said, I've been in this community 31 years, and it's great to see us evolving and contributing and keeping it going. And you know, for a long time there, I wanted to give up. But now that I'm looking at you, it gives me some hope that the work that was done in the trenches is now rubbing off, has rubbed off on the young people, and they're trying to do their part. They're trying to have a, a voice. And it's great to see that not just people in the community, it's good to see visible minorities. Good to see people that I can relate to. And it's good to see people that look like me. So I just want to say thank you so much for the conversation today. Okay, if the girls want to get a hold of you, just tell us how we get a hold of you. You have a website, email address, phone number. Yes, my phone number, my work phone number is 647 206 9653. And if you want to reach me by email, it's going to be K. Wiltshire and Wiltshire is spelled W I L T S H I R E. So that will be K. Wiltshire at black dash cat.com. Thank you so much for a great conversation today and thank you for the great work that you do. We appreciate it. So, ladies and gentlemen, on the show today, I have Miss Katanya Richards from Black Cap. She cleared up a lot for us um, about helping the trans community with harm reduction and whatever else services that they need if they need and during this pandemic time for food and just information to get them the resources that can help them. Until then, you guys stay safe. Thank you for joining me here on the Stephanie Stevens Show. And thank you so much. Thank for you. You're welcome. And inspiring. I take my hat. Thank and my you. You're welcome. Too. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.